This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Palestinians waiting for humanitarian aid in Gaza are coming under fire from Israeli forces in Gaza as acute hunger and severe malnutrition are spreading. In the latest attack earlier today, over 100 Palestinians were killed and more than 700 wounded in Gaza City when they came under fire from Israeli tanks and drones. Over half a million people in Gaza are on the cusp of starvation, while virtually the entire population of 2.3 million people is in desperate need of food as a result of the continued Israeli bombardment, ground attacks, and ongoing siege. According to the United Nations, the amount of aid reaching the Palestinian territory dropped by 50 percent in February compared to the previous month. This is Ramesh Rajasingham, Coordination Director of the UN's Humanitarian Office, speaking at the Security Council on Wednesday. In December, it was projected that the entire population of 2.2 million people in Gaza would face high levels of acute food insecurity by February 2024. The highest share of people facing this level of food insecurity ever recorded worldwide. And here we are at the end of February with at least 576,000 people in Gaza, one quarter of the population, one step away from famine. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Michael Fahri, says Israel's intentionally starving Palestinians and should be held accountable for war crimes. Michael Fahri joins us now from Eugene, Oregon. He's a professor of law at the University of Oregon. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Michael Fahri. Why don't you lay out what you understand is happening and what is international law around the right to food? Yes, thank you, Amy. Every single person in Gaza is hungry right now. A quarter of the population, so that's a half a million people, are starving, and famine is imminent. We've never seen an entire population, 2.2 million people, made to go hungry this quickly and this completely. And people's health is rapidly declining. What's really concerning now is we're starting to hear reports of children dying from dehydration, malnutrition, and starvation. We've never seen children pushed into malnutrition so quickly. Um, in the almost five months of war, there have been more children, more journalists, more medical personnel, more, uh, more UN staff killed more than anywhere else in the world in any conflict. In early October, um, when the, this war began, uh, myself, amongst other independent UN human rights experts, immediately called for a warning of a risk of genocide asking that there be an immediate ceasefire to prevent genocide. Unfortunately, what's happened is it, um, the war has gotten worse. Israel's uh, uh, attacks against civilians has continued and expanded. And I think it's safe to say this is a genocide. And now we're in the situation where we're seeing uh, starvation and we're seeing the denial of humanitarian aid and the destruction of the food system itself in Gaza. And, and Michael, if you could respond to the news from earlier today, uh, authorities in Gaza saying Israeli forces committed a massacre in Gaza City, killing at least 104 Palestinians as they waited for food aid. Gaza's health ministry says over 760 people were wounded in what Hamas called an unprecedented war crime. According to eyewitnesses, Israeli forces opened fire on the crowd who'd gathered around humanitarian aid trucks. So if you could uh, respond to that and, you know, what that means in terms of the very little food aid getting in uh, and people trying to get it, and, and then this is what happens. Yes, this isn't... So, unfortunately, this isn't the first time people have been shot, out, shot at by Israeli forces while trying to get access to aid. So this most recent story is, has been the most tragic in, in terms of the number of dead and the number of wounded. But there have been repeated reports of Israeli uh, forces shooting at Palestinian civilians who are waiting to receive aid. Um, we've also heard reports of is, uh, Israel bombarding convoys of aid trucks even after those routes are coordinated with Israeli forces. So Israeli forces know exactly where those convoys are, and nevertheless, they are uh, 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 shooting at them. Uh, moreover, there's been planned convoys that have been attempted to be sent to northern Gaza, and the last convoy that was sent 
uh, that Israel allowed to reach northern Gaza was January 23rd. So not only is Israel shooting at people getting aid, uh, bombarding trucks um, uh, en route, they're denying uh, uh, convoys from reaching the north, and they're making it very difficult for uh, trucks to cross the borders, as we heard from Senator Merkley, whether it's through Rafah crossing the border with Egypt, or where most aid is coming through is the Karam Shalom crossing, which um, uh, uh, is through uh, Israel. So, Michael Fakhri, you're really explaining a dire situation. I mean, um, looking on film at people in Gaza, the sunken eyes, how skinny their bodies are. We have reports. Uh, Al Jazeera was just doing a report from uh, one of the hospitals in northern Gaza. Um, it was Kamal Adwan Hospital, where they said infants uh, are in the hospital. They no longer have parents. Usually at the hospital, there's a can of milk for every infant. Here, there isn't a can for the entire ward. What does it mean to be the U.N. Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food? What kind of power do you have? What kind of reports do you do? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm running out of words to be able to describe the horror of what's happening and how vile the actions have been by Israel against the Palestinian civilians. My job is to be—I'm an independent expert. I'm given authority by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. This is a volunteer position. My job is to be the eyes, ears, and sometimes good conscience for the UN system on all matters regarding hunger, malnutrition, and famine from a human rights perspective. So what I do is I present reports to the Human Rights Council and to the General Assembly. I decide what's on the agenda when I present to them. I decide what is the right to food agenda when presenting to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. Um, so my most recent report when I go to the, General, uh, to the Human Rights Council next week will be on the role of small-scale fishers. Um, and uh, what I will be doing now between now and then uh, the General Assembly in October is my next report will be on starvation with an emphasis on Gaza, because unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in conflict all over the world. Conflict is the main source of hunger uh, um, in the world. And also for that report to create a record of what's going on in Gaza, because we're seeing starvation we're, and we're at the brink of famine. And what's uh, the thing to remember about starvation and famine, it's always, always human-made. It's always the result of political choices. Never has there been um, a famine in modern history that was not because people with power made very specific choices and chose and decided to punish civilians. And what we're seeing in Gaza is no different than that historical record. Michael Fakhri, could you talk about the uh, International Court of Justice uh, ordering uh, provisional measures and what's come of that? To what extent did Israel comply with those provisional measures? Yeah, on, on January uh, 26, the International Court of Justice stated in its provisional measures, um, and here I'm going to quote verbatim, that the state of Israel must take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. What the court also did is it considered the catastrophic humanitarian situation, this is, these are their words, in the Gaza Strip is, quote, at a serious risk of deteriorating. That's the International Court of Justice uh, in late January. What happened instead, Israel did not comply with the court. In fact, it tried to undermine the court's authority. And what they did, in fact, is they've been restricting and denying the delivery of humanitarian aid to people in Gaza. Um, and around that same time in late January, uh, Israel denied there was even a humanitarian crisis or starvation. And so what we saw instead of compliance with the International Court of Justice is a reduction of humanitarian aid by 50 percent. Um, and so to put it in perspective, before the war began, approximately 500 trucks uh, used to enter Gaza a day. Now, if we're lucky, the average is about 100, but it's, uh, that's, that's you know, uh, an average amount. The other thing to remember, even before all of this happened, is Israel had a lot of control over the entry of food into Gaza through a 17-year blockade. 
because the question we have to ask, how was Israel able to make 2.2 million people go so hungry so quickly and completely? They were already keeping people on the brink of hunger through the 17-year blockade, making it very difficult for fishers to access the sea. And 50% of people in Gaza before the war were already food insecure. 80% uh, relied on humanitarian aid. So it's, inc- it's so clear that not only is Israel not complying with the International Court of Justice, but I would add now that Israel is using humanitarian aid as a bargaining chip. So not only is it breaching international law and the uh, order of the International Court of Justice, it's clear now because what we saw on Tuesday, this is February 27th, this Tuesday, Israel and Hamas began negotiating for a potential 40-day truce. And it's important to note what has Israel offered in, in, in the negotiations. They've offered humanitarian relief to Palestinians in Gaza. So what Israel is offering for cons- they want concessions from Hamas, they're offering things like a commitment to bring in 500 trucks per day of humanitarian aid. Israel is potentially committing to providing 200,000 tents and 60,000 caravans, and they're uh, offering to rehabilitate hospitals and bakeries um, and to allow for the necessary equipment uh, to enter. This is the bare minimum. What they're offering as a political negotiation is the basic bare minimum as a legal obligation um, in terms of international humanitarian law, as a legal obligation to comply with the International Court of Justice, as a legal obligation to meet uh, human rights law. But again, this is the bare minimum. And they've been withholding this. They've been withholding this. And now that we see the negotiations for a truce, we see how Israel is using it as a bargaining chip to offer something as if it's a political choice and not a legal, and I would add, a moral obligation. Is Israel committing a war crime, Michael Fakhri? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, they are committing war crimes. But let me add a war crime. What's interesting about war crimes is we can only hold individuals accountable for war crimes. Um, This is something, I think, more existential. This is why we are saying, uh, we being the uh, uh, dozens of independent UN human rights experts, are saying this is genocide. This is why the International Court of Justice is saying there's a plausible case for genocide from their perspective. What we mean by saying this is genocide means that Palestinian people, the people, are being targeted simply because they are Palestinian simply because of who they are. This is what makes it genocide. What's important about framing it genocide is, of course, the remedy that, uh, that is available. Genocide means the state of Israel itself is culpable. That Because if to go back to starvation, this is a systemic denial of humanitarian aid. This is a political choice to use the denial of humanitarian aid and starving of people as a political bargaining chip. This means that the entire state of Israel is culpable, but that also means that the remedy is not just throw this individual or that individual in jail, maybe in some few years in the future. What the remedy is for genocide is uh, fully recognizing the right of the Palestinian people uh, to, for self-determination. This is why it's important to understand this as a genocide. Let's move from Gaza to the West Bank. Um, Can you talk about the attacks on farmers on the West Bank? What is happening on the ground? Who is responsible, Michael Fakhri? Yeah, so what's also interesting is that uh, when uh, when this uh, particular war started in Gaza, immediately we saw an escalation of violence by uh, Israeli settlers against Palestinians and specifically against Palestinian uh, farmers. And we saw increased violence by Israeli forces against Palestinians in the West Bank. And so what's happened now is that um, the the harvest season for olives has passed and and farmers were not able to harvest olives. This has several implications. So there's a record number of violence we're seeing in the West Bank um, more than ever in, in, in recent times. And attacking the olive trees and olive harvest is not just about uh, olives, which are important for nutrition and for food um, and for uh, making sure that the land remains um, fruitful in the future. The olive tree is central to Palestinian identity. It reflects and is a a core aspect of the Palestinian people's relationship to the land, 
to traditions, to their ancestors, and to the future. And so to attack and, and uh, undermine and eliminate some um, olive trees is, again, attack against the Palestinian people at their core. So what we're seeing, again, this is why we're, there we're so concerned that it's not, this is not just about a war in Gaza. This is, an, this is escalated violence against Palestinian people. And you, and you can track this when you follow food, when you follow the relation, uh, agriculture, when you look at fishers in Gaza. Um, and if I might turn also to how uh, the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, has been uh, threatened by the lack of funding. So because of unfounded claims by Israel, claiming that at first they said 12, and now the, the number is down to nine employees out of 30,000 employees, major do donors to UNRWA have decided to end funding. This includes the United States, Germany, Canada, Japan, amongst many others. This punishes all Palestinian refugees across the board, not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, but also in Lebanon, in Syria, and Jordan. So time and time again, what we are seeing is this increased rate of violence against all Palestinian people simply because of who they are. And Michael Fakhri, let's just end with the global hunger crisis, which the World Food Program has noted is of unprecedented proportions. In just two years, the number of people facing or at risk of acute food insecurity increased from 135 million before the pandemic to 345 million now. Yes, so um, before the pandemic, we were already seeing a rise in the rates of hunger and malnutrition. This started in 2015. When the pandemic started in 2020, it immediately triggered um, a, a hunger crisis in the whole world. And so rich countries, poor countries alike, all of a sudden there was a spike in, in hunger. Now, uh, when the pandemic then formally ended, what happened is the hunger crisis actually got worse. The reason is because there were temporary measures and social programs that were put in place during the pandemic to deal with a health crisis. This is things like universal school meals for uh, children, sometimes throughout the whole year, not just the academic year, um, direct cash payments to people supporting uh, local uh, food markets, local farmers markets. These programs are put in place uh, as temporary measures to deal with the pandemic and the food crisis of the pandemic. We have 30 and seconds, Michael. So what needs to be done is to turn those temporary programs into permanent programs. Otherwise, this global food crisis is only going to get worse. Michael Fakhri is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food and a professor of law at the University of Oregon.